This is Malik Kahuk from the University of Colorado, and the topic today is pseudophagic pupillary block. Let's start off with a case presentation. A 65-year-old female with recent history of right eye cataract extraction with IOL implantation presented at an outside facility with flashes and floaters and was noted on examination of the right eye to have pigmented vitreous cell and a small horseshoe tear at 12 o'clock. Cryopexy was completed and the patient was sent home with a plan for close follow-up. Later that night, the on-call university ophthalmologist was paged at 8 p.m. The patient was complaining of right-sided eye pain and head pain that was rated 10 out of 10. She was experiencing nausea with gradual decline in vision of the right eye. On examination, vision was 2100 and the pressure was 58 millimeters of mercury by Goldman applination. Slit lamp exam revealed this finding. You can see here that the optic, the intraocular lens with the haptics placed approximately at three and nine o'clock was shifted forward with iris capture. Here's a more clear photo showing the area of the haptics clearly delineated by the peaked pupil on this side and the optic anterior to the iris. The initial management consisted of timolol, Alphagan, Trusopt, and Diamox PO. We also initiated atropine 1% and phenylephrine 2.5% to dilate the pupil. One hour later, the pressure was 23, the nausea had resolved, and the pain was completely resolved. This is an image of the same patient two hours after initial presentation and post dilation. You can see that the optic is now mostly behind the iris and that there's clear communication of the aqueous humor from behind the iris to the front of the iris. When it comes to pseudophagic pupillary block, there are multiple causes and clinical findings that should be noted. From a cause standpoint, iris capture of an implanted intraocular lens can lead to pupillary block. This is relatively uncommon, and I'll get back to this point in the next slides. Posterior synechia with iris to lens or anterior capsule can also be a cause. If a previously placed LPI was closed due to apposition with the lens or the capsule, this can lead to pupillary block. A leaking wound with shallowing of the anterior chamber and shifting of the intraocular lens can lead to pupillary block. In rare cases, a summer ring ring pushing the IOL forward can lead to this clinical picture. Rarely, an upside down placement of an intraocular lens with anterior vaulting of the lens could lead to pupillary block. Core capsular support with zonules that are loose, allowing for shifting of the intraocular lens, or an extremely large rexus, which allows for escape of the lens from the capsule, can lead to elevated pressure secondary to pupillary block. This can occur with any lens type, anterior chamber lenses, posterior chamber lenses, sulcus or capsule placed lenses, and piggyback lenses. I've highlighted core capsular support as well as the word sulcus here because these are the scenarios where I've seen this picture clinically, typically with a large rexus allowing for escape of the intraocular lens with trauma or sulcus placed lenses that have poor support with shifting of the lens forward are really the only cases where I've seen this. From a clinical finding standpoint, you can see an irregular, poorly reactive pupil, elevated pressure, corneal edema, shallowing of the anterior chamber with flare and cell, posterior synechia, occluded PI, iris bombay, iris atrophy with transillumination defects, and a sublux displaced IOL, and of course iris capture as noted in the case that is being presented. Risk factors include nanophthalmus with a small crowded anterior chamber, Weak zonules with poor capsular support, again, sulcus placed IOL, secondary piggyback lenses, undersized or poorly sized anterior chamber intraocular lenses, a large capsular excess, upside down placement of an intraocular lens with anterior vault. And this has also been noted with phagic intraocular lenses. The treatment is straightforward with topical and oral medications to decrease intraocular pressure. Avoid myotics, which can increase capture of the optic. Definitive therapy depends on the mechanism. An LPI could be placed for processes that include posterior synechia with adhesion to the iris and or lens capsule. Breaking iris and IOL synechia, which is a surgical procedure, can also be performed, sometimes also combined with exchange of the intraocular lens. 
Manipulation of the intraocular lens can take place both surgically and non-surgically. Surgical repositioning can occur when a sulcus placed lens is the causative factor. From a non-surgical standpoint, dilating the pupil and having the patient rest in a supine position can frequently reposition the intraocular lens until definitive therapy can take place. Filtering surgery is rarely needed and only in chronic cases where the patient was late to present or the condition was unrecognized for a long period of time. Proper surgical practices with phacoemulsification and intraocular lens implantation are the main preventive factors in most cases. Making a small capsular excess that just covers the optic edge, proper positioning of the intraocular lens with posterior vault rather than flipping the lens with anterior vault, which unfortunately can occur, but is most frequently recognized intraoperatively. Avoid placing a single piece intraocular lens in the sulcus. This is actually the case that we're presenting here today. In the previous cataract surgery that this patient had shortly before the horseshoe tear, the single piece intraocular lens was inadvertently placed in the sulcus and led to the eventual optic capture due to poor support of the intraocular lens Regardless, single-piece intraocular lenses should not be placed in the sulcus due to the high risk of UGH syndrome with rubbing of the square haptics along the uveal tissue. Avoid piggyback lenses and small eyes. Proper size and positioning of LPIs when needed to avoid proximity to the optic body and secure closure of wounds postoperatively to avoid shallowing of the anterior chamber. In our patient's case, we maintained her on atropine until the time of surgery. Since she was coming to us from an outside facility, she returned to the original facility with eye well repositioning into the capsular bag completed without complications. She recovered well without need for intraocular pressure lowering medications, and vision was back to 2020. While optic capture by the iris is rare, it is important to keep this in mind as one of the potential causative factors for acute rise in intraocular pressure and decrease in visual acuity. Consider visiting keogt.com for further educational material. This lecture and other lectures can be found on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for your time.